That's not what I'm going to be talking about this morning. One thing I ask from the Lord, that only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. We've uh, used that verse a lot in worship lately. Let's pray. Father, we're in this place right now. We're asking one thing from you, that we may dwell in your house, to be in your presence, to gaze on the beauty of your face, to seek you out in your dwelling place. Father, may this be the, the story and the trajectory of our lives. Father, as I share some thoughts now, um, I pray that you would bring them to life, Lord. We need to hear from you this morning, Father. We need you to share, to disclose your heart to us, Father, so that we can walk in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a really challenging message this morning. Um, i be honest, I don't really feel up to it, but I suppose that's a good thing. Matthew um, 22. Um, Jesus has been teaching. And hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. Me. Lively. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let me read it again. Hearing that Jesus has silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees were like the kind of politicians. They were, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees are both sects of Judaism um, and the technical differences between them. But the Sadducees really, they, they didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in life after death, quite what they did believe. that They believed in the law. Um, but they were more like politicians, really. Um, and the Pharisees were experts in the scriptures in the Old Testament. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Good question, really. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your Soul, with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now we would probably have expected Jesus to go for one of the Ten Commandments. Because we know the Ten Commandments quite well. Um, and the first of the Ten Commandments... Um, Exodus 20 verse 3 is a little bit like the one that Jesus quotes first. I'm the Lord your God, I, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So there's a certain similarity there, but Jesus doesn't go for that. He goes, gives them two commandments out of Moses' law. One of them is very, very well known. In fact, if you're Jewish... You know it even better than the Ten Commandments because you would repeat it every morning and every evening. And it's called the Shema. And it's that. Deuteronomy 6, 5 and 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
Shema comes from the first word of the passage in Hebrew. It means listen or hear. And um, I want to look at that command in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. But Jesus threw in another command, sort of a bonus, really. If you like that, you'll love this. Um, this is a little bit more obscure to us, anyway. It's in Leviticus. And, um, you know, if you've got a, a secret habit of reading Leviticus when no one else is around, then um, good for you. <laughs> I don't think the Pharisees would have found it more obscure. I think they would have this down. Um, they would know it well. And it says this, Leviticus 19.18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. And it comes towards the end of a whole page full of social laws. Because love your neighbour as yourself, it doesn't mean give them a hug. Um, it doesn't mean fall in love with them. It doesn't mean be codependent on them in some way. Um, it, 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 it puts it into a, a context with, with, within which they understand what it means. And th these are some examples of the laws around that in that chapter of Leviticus. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not defraud or rob your neighbour. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not spread slander. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbour's life. There's more as well, but those are the ones that particularly spring out. And then it says, do not seek revenge or bear, or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love the, your neighbour as yourself. I'm the Lord. And then it goes on about do not wear clothing woven of two different materials. And I'm not sure where that fits in. So I don't know how we missed it, really. It's there in plain sight. Love your neighbour as yourself. As part of this structure of, of social laws. How to live together as a community. Part of a list of very sensible neighbour things. Don't lie about your neighbours. Don't rip them off. Don't be biased or prejudiced. Don't be reckless. And don't wear mixed fabrics. So what's Jesus saying to the Pharisees here? Clearly that neighbour thing is important. It's, a, it, it's an expression of their faith, their religion. They walk with God. And the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength, is something which is really, really fundamental to them as people. And Jesus says that, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And I want to look in some detail at this. It's a proper challenge. It's one of those passages that really forces yourself to take a really long, hard look at yourself. So let's do that. One thing have I desired, and this only will I seek. So I'm just going to look at the first of these commands in detail. So Jesus refers them back to the Shema, this um, passage in Deuteronomy that they knew very well indeed. It's one of the defining pillars of what it meant to be Jew. Still is. Um, if you're Jewish, if you're a religious Jew, you would say this, this, this prayer, let's say it as a prayer, um, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So the first thing there is love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. 
Because when we love the Lord, our God, loving our neighbour, is a natural thing. And loving our neighbour flows from loving the Lord our God. When you see Lord capitalised like that in the Bible, which you see a lot in the Old Testament, um, not quite every time you see Lord, but very often you see it capitalised like that, it's referring to God's personal name that he revealed to Moses and to the people of Israel. He's not just God in a generic sense. You hardly ever see that in the Bible. You quite often hear people praying, saying, Oh God, God do this, God do that. And you sometimes it gets into worship songs as well. But it's hardly ever seen that way in Scripture. God's always qualified. The word God is always qualified. It's always my God or the God of our fathers. Or the Lord, our God in this case. Or in the New Testament, we might see the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's that God. This God is my God. He's the one I worship. He's the one I devote my life to. He's not just God in the generic sense. Because he fills the universe. He's impossible for us to encounter, to embrace, to engage with. He's too big. But God is personal. And he meets with us where we are. We can't comprehend him in the raw. So he places himself in a context for us. Love the Lord your God. And the Lord is God's personal name, as I said. The name by which he revealed himself to Moses. And it, it's a particular, it, it, it's a kind of an odd sort of name. It, it, it's, it's, it's his name, but it's also a self-disclosure. He's telling Moses who he is, but it's a kind of a challenge. To the Jews, this name it was holy, it was so holy, in fact, that they wouldn't even write it down. Far less say it. So when we come across Lord, capital letters, in the Old Testament, this is standing for an abbreviation, YHWH. They took all the vowels out. Not that Hebrew had vowels in any case, but they, they took the vowels out so you couldn't actually say it. We render it as Yahweh. But they won't say it. The Jews wouldn't say it. Because it's holy. It's God's personal name. He is present. In fact, many Jews, when they, when, they, when they speak of the Lord, they just refer to Hashem, the name. Name above all names. And Yahweh means something like I am, or I am that I am. In, in Revelation, we see Jesus revealing himself as, as the one who is and who was and who is to come. It's that sort of sense. It's, it's I am, but it's not just me now. It's I've always been and I always will be. It's, it's a sense of I am. But it's kind of a riddle because God speaks this to Moses. Say I am has sent me. And it's as if God is asking his people, who am I? And it's a kind of an invitation for them to get to know him, to draw close to him. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek. To draw close to him. And it leads us on to this thought of who am I to you? God wants to be personal with us, and he wants us to be personal with him. He wants us to, to know him, to seek out his face, to love him with all of our... And that's what he, his name draws us into that. 
Who am I to you? Who is he to us each individually? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek. And they repeated this to themselves twice a day, in the morning with their cornflakes and in the evening with their horlicks. It's underscoring their identity as the people of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. They are, and we are, Jesus reminds the Pharisees, to love the Lord, their God, with all their hearts. So what is your heart? I don't read Hebrew, but sometimes it's helpful to remind ourselves that we're reading this in translation. And that um, the word here is levav. Back in the day, they didn't have much idea about anatomy. Uh, in Hebrew, there is no real concept of a brain. They didn't have a word for brain, actually, which is kind of, a, a, that surprised me, shocked me a bit, actually. They didn't have a word for brain. So, they knew about the heart, though. They understood that it was an organ that pumped blood about the body and kept you alive. And so part of this is you're going to love the Lord your God with your physical being. But that's not really what they mean here. They thought that all your thinking or your intellectual processes went on in your heart. You know with your heart. You understand with your heart. Wisdom reposes in the heart, Proverbs 14.33. The heart is where you make sense of the world. And also the heart is where you feel emotions. Hannah had pain in her heart when she couldn't have children. Your heart can melt with fear like it does in um, Joshua, chapter 6. To be happy is to have a heart of joy. Your heart is where you desire things and make choices. David had it in his heart to build a temple for the Lord. Your heart has desires and affections. To the Jews, the heart was the centre of their being. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I think the King James says, out of it are the issues of life. Jeremiah, the heart is fundamentally corrupt. 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's a hard one. Which is why the prophets like Ezekiel said that it would have to be changed or replaced. Ezekiel 26, 36, I will give you a new heart. Take away, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you, I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, so that God could write his commands on it. Jeremiah again, 31, 33, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. So if I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart, it means with my physical being, it means with my thinking, it means with my emotions, it means with my decision making. And it means bringing all of this under his sovereignty, under his control. Because the heart is deceitful and wicked. And it needs to be replaced so that he can write his law upon it. That's loving the Lord with all my 
heart. And then he says soul. Soul is an interesting one. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. When we think of soul, when we think of the thing that goes to heaven when we die, we think of this kind of ethereal, floaty thing, a bit woo. God breathed and it became, man became a living soul. And it's in the breath. <coughs> Actually, that's the spirit. Um, that isn't how the, the people in the Bible thought about it. There's a confusion because um, in the New Testament, the word for soul, the word that gets translated as soul, is psyche, which Aristotle had written about as a kind of an invisible floaty thing. And so we kind of get this. People that in the Middle Ages who read the New Testament in Greek had also read Aristotle, and so they got this idea in their heads. But that's not what the Jewish people thought about soul. And the word that, and, and I think it's not only the greatest translation to translate this word as soul. The word is nephesh, and it literally means throat. That's the Lord your God with all your throat. Okay, what? How do you get from throat to soul? As I said, <laughs> um, when Joseph was carried off to Egypt, um, his nephesh was put in an iron shackle. Psalm 105, verse 18. Your, and your, your, your throat, let's face it, your throat's a really important part of it. Uh, and it, it's, it's exactly the opposite to this sort of ghostly thing that floats about. Nefesh is very solid. You breathe through it. Blood pumps through it. Food passes through it. Your voice comes out of it and it expresses your thoughts. So you can see how in the kind of ancient way of thinking, your throat, the bit that connects your head to your body, it becomes a kind of a, it's sort of, it a metaphor for the whole of your being. It sort of stands in place for your entire, not just your body, but all of you. Because it's where your thoughts and emotions are, that they, they, they find expression coming through your throat, from your heart, out through your mouth. It's where you take food in and you sustain yourself, you drink water. Um, yeah, it's, it's an important part of your being. Um, so, it sort of comes to the sound for your whole life. As the dear, oh, Psalm 42 puts this into great context. This is not talking about a floaty, ethereal thing. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my nephesh, my soul, pants for you. Why? He's thirsty. As a deer pants for water, but it's a spiritual thing too. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Then in verse 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? That's not his throat, that's downcast, by the way. Why are you disturbed within me? Put your hope. In God, and then in verse 6, you get the same image again. Why, uh, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. So you've got this idea that his soul is something kind of spiritual. It's something uh, which is to do with his emotions and to do with his spiritual health. But it's also a physical thing. It's, it's like a deer panting for water. So the love your, to, to love the Lord our God with all of our soul, is with all of our being, to honour him in what we do and in what we say, with all of our capabilities and our limitations as well. All of our being. And that would be everything that passes through your throat. So that would be the, your speech, your language, what you express, how we sing, how we worship, what we say, what we consume, not just in terms of food, but in terms of everything. 
terms of the company we keep, in terms of what we watch on TV, in terms of what we read, in terms of what we listen to, in terms of our, our life, our breath, everything. We're going to love the Lord our God with it. We're going to honour him in that place. Now, nefesh. In our throat. Strength is also another odd one. Okay, so, um, love the Lord your God with all your strength. So there is that Hebrew word for strength, but this one isn't it. This is mi'od, and it's actually an adjective. Um, it means extremely. Love the Lord your God with all your extremely. Genesis 4, 5, Cain wasn't just angry. He was meod angry. He was extremely angry. That's how the word gets used, and here it's being used in a different way. So, literally, it doesn't make sense. But we kind of get it. You sort of understand what this is. You're going to love it with all, all of your extremeness, with all of your, your, to the max, basically. And it refers to our everything, to our intensity. Our strength, I suppose. As loose translations go, it's quite a useful one. And it also amplifies the other two parts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart to the maximum of your ability, with all you can. Love the Lord your God with all your soul to your very best to all you've got in your being pour your all into this so back to Jesus and the Pharisees because Jesus is being a little bit naughty here I don't know if you've noticed this you probably did notice it because you know not much gets past us does it really <clears throat> he says this talking to the Pharisees he says love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. All your mind, he's kind of slipped that in. Do you think they wouldn't notice? Bearing in mind that they recite this prayer in Hebrew twice a day, with their blood pressure meds, morning and evening. Where does mind come from in this context? I mean, maybe it's just that you couldn't translate metal very well into Greek. But that doesn't really work. I don't think that's what it is. I don't think that's this. That's it. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees who are asking Jesus questions, they always have an agenda. They're always trying to trip him up. They're always hatching a scheme. They want to kill him. And they're trying to trap him into saying something that they could accuse him of. And they ask him all kinds of questions. Questions, questions all the time. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus says, let Caesar give you money. But make sure God gets his due. And here he says, which is the greatest commandments in the law? Because that's a big deal to the Pharisees. It's quite a big deal to the Sadducees too, I guess. And he answers them with a really wise answer. Of course, you know, you, you, you're a Jew, you know the Shema, that's, keep it. But he changes that last little bit. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. The mind. It's their creativity and their imagination. What they come out with. Because what are they using their minds for? They're using their minds to try and trap him. They're using their minds to plot against him, to scheme against him. To try and figure out how they can bring him down. To try and trip him up. To try and make him say something that they can accuse him of. And that, that's, that's what they're using their mind for. They're, all their creativity and all of their imagination. And he's calling them out for it. He's saying, don't do that. 
Love the Lord your God with that part of your being instead. If you're going to hatch schemes, hatch schemes for the glory of God. If you're going to have a conspiracy, have a conspiracy that brings the kingdom of God. Get together and figure out how you can serve him better. If you're going to get together in a corner and conspire, turn it into a prayer meeting. Worship him. Love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Because we know that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And so your heart's going to be changed and renewed and God's going to write his law on it. And you're going to worship the Lord with all of that part of you. And this is the sim- it's a similar. All of those things that you're trying to do, all of these schemes that you're trying to hatch, divert, use them for the glory of God. Worship God there. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your imagination. With all of that bit of you that is currently being bent to some other end. If you're going to have a cunning plan, use it to the glory of God and for his kingdom and not just to discord. So what do we take away from this? First thing, love the Lord your God. Zone in on him. Make him your priority, your one thing. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek. Who is he? Get to know him. Get to know him. Then shall I know even as I am known, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13. And who is he to me? Who is the Lord my God? Who is he that brought me out of darkness into light, gave me salvation? Gave me hope, gave me identity, wrote his law on my heart so that I won't sin against him. Love the Lord your God with all your mm, heart, with your life, with your knowledge, with your understanding, with your wisdom, with your emotions, your desires, with your choices, with your affections. Love the Lord your God. With all of those things. Love the Lord your God with your nephesh, with your throat, with your soul. Your whole being, your physical capability, as well as all your actions, your emotions, and that spiritual side of you too. Your whole being. When God breathed into Adam, breathed his spirit, his, his ruach, into Adam. And Adam became a living nefesh. He became alive. He became alive with the whole of God living in him. A living soul. A living being. The whole of his being. That is what we're supposed to worship God with. Love the Lord your God to the max, to extremity, with all of our strength and energy and power. And finally, the bit that Jesus added on for the sake of the Jewish leaders who were trying to scheme against him. With all of our mind, all of our creativity. All of our imagination. All of our cleverness. Use it for the kingdom and the glory of God, not for divisiveness, not for self aggrandizement. Let's pray. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it love your neighbor. As yourself. <clears throat> Father, I pray that we would encounter you afresh. That we would meet with you, Lord, in a new way. Lead us on, Lord. Just like Moses at the burning bush, Father. Let's encounter you 
in a, a, a fresh way, Lord. Show us who you are. Show us who you are. Reveal yourself to us. Every day. Our saviour, our healer, our friend, our deliverer. You are the lover of our nefesh. Of our soul. And help us to love you with all of our being, with everything in sense, every fibre of our being. Father, with our past, our present and our future, we dedicate it to you, Lord. We give it to you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I worship you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Amen. We're going to sing another song. <laughs>